betterment versus development. Betterment is those activities that improve conditions. Yeah, do a community cleanup. That's betterment activity. Uh, you feed some uh, a hungry guy. That's betterment. That relieves hunger. It improves the condition. Development strengthens capacity. Enables people to be to, to be stronger, to be more fully functioning. Two distinctions here. Somebody mentioned earlier, feed a man a fish. You got that one? So you got a feed a fish. That is an individual betterment activity, right? You got a guy that's hungry, and you do an activity that relieves his hunger. You feed him a fish. That's an individual betterment activity. That quadrant is usually how we enter into urban ministry or human services. We do service to that individual. We see a kid in need, in trouble. We help that kid. We see a widow that needs her porch fixed. We help her. That's an individual, individual betterment activity. If we want to move that to development, then we, then we what with the guy with the fish? We teach him to fish. We give him some instructions on uh, how to how to bait a hook and do casting and set a bobber and get him out there in the lake and say, catch your own fish. And he catches his fish and feels good about himself. Uh, let, me follow that, let me follow that scenario through a little bit. Guy comes in, you feed him a fish, he comes back tomorrow. You feed him another fish. He comes back again, third time. You feed him a fish, but you begin to wonder, is this guy starting to depend on me a little bit too much? Am I creating some dependency here with this guy? You feed him again, keeps coming back, and pretty, well, pretty, pretty soon you're concluding, yep, he's just becoming dependent on me. And so you start thinking, how can, I, how can I move him in a direction of taking care of his own needs? And so you say, let's, let's do a little fishing lesson here. I'll teach you what I know about fishing. He goes out in a lake, and he starts catching fish. He gets better at it. He's feeding his family. Things are really looking good. The word gets out with uh, some other guys that are hungry, and they start coming into your church because the word gets out, they'll feed you fish there. But the more guys that come in, you say, wait a second, I understand you're hungry today, but, but I got this fishing class that's going on, I want you to join my fishing class. And so you, you got a fishing class that teaches guys how to fish, and, and now you got them out there in the lake, and these guys are catching fish and, and feeding their family. You're feeling really great. And a problem develops. They say, uh, we're not catching as many fish as we used to. The fish are getting smaller. And some guys have been out there, they've, they've fished all day long, and they haven't caught anything. So the word gets back to you, we've fished out the lake. You got a community problem now. And so you say, well, this community problem of a, deplete, a depleted lake will take a community solution. And so you have some contacts and you write a grant to stock the lake. You get some money from a foundation. You work out a deal with the, uh, the State Department of, of Natural Resources. They get some fish out of their fish hatcheries. They bring them back and stock the lake. And in a little while, you're back in business. Guys are happy again. They're catching fish. Fish are growing. But over a few, over a few months, uh, they start fishing out the lake again. 
and before long they've depleted it and now you've got to go back and write another grant to another foundation to get another grant to stock, stock the, the lake again. And you do that, you've got contacts. But about the third time this happens, foundations are starting to ask the question, the same question that you ask of the individual, are they starting to get a little dependent on us? Betterment leads to dependency. And so the foundations are saying, uh, I don't know, we already gave you two grants, uh, you, gotta, you better, figure out a, better figure out another way to do this. And so it pushes you in the development direction to do this, to get a loan to buy the lake. You get a loan, that means you've got to have a business plan. That means you've got to figure out, you've got to convince a lender that you're going to generate enough income to pay back that loan. You've got to have a business plan. So now you take control of the lake, uh, you can issue fishing licenses to get some revenue that way. Uh, you can charge guys so much a pound for the fish that they catch out of there. There's some revenue. Uh, you can generate enough revenue so that, so that you can hire a, a, a naturalist, a consultant, to tell you the best breed of hybrid fish that'll thrive in that lake. And so now the fish population is growing, but you can limit the amount of fishing that's going in there because you, can, you control the lake. And if you do a really good job, uh, these guys are catching enough fish so that they're feeding their family, and they're catching a surplus. Now they're paying you so much a pound, but they're catching a surplus, and they're looking to, for a market for their fish, selling it to their neighbors. You say, wait a second, I'll bet we have enough volume here to do a fish cannery. So we can get another loan and we do a fish cannery and now we're creating some employment through the, through the fish that are being caught out of the lake and it becomes a, an enterprise that ignites market forces in a whole community. You see how we go from an individual betterment strategy to developing people to taking it into the, a community context to not only do betterment activities there, but so that the community becomes uh, fully economically functioning. It becomes self-sustaining. You get the progression. Okay, let me, let me give you an example. We, uh, when we moved into the inner city, uh, there is a an old uh, Presbyterian church just a block from our house that had uh, gone out of business and we asked the Presbyterians if we could open that church up and invite the community in and, and uh, we did. Uh, and we started, a, uh, we started a, a Wednesday noon service and lunch and we got some of our suburban church partners to bring a hot meal, uh, rotate one, one Wednesday a month they brought a hot meal in to serve and, uh, and also collected canned goods so that when they came in, folks could leave with a, with a bag of, can, uh, of canned goods. And it was nice. It was, that was a good way to interact with the community and it, and it was a betterment activity. It, it relieved hunger. But over time, uh, attitudes started to show up, particularly among the volunteers saying, you know, these are the these are the same folks that have been coming here every Wednesday now for, for two years. Are we really helping them? Raises the question of dependency. And a little attitude's like, well, at least, at least they could clean up after themselves. At least, at least they could help us wipe the tables. So is this, it's, and so they did, they, they asked folks to participate a little bit more and that was good. But the, but the distribution of, of the canned goods was always problematic. Uh, wasn't enough of the same thing. Some folks got things that they liked. Other folks got things that they didn't like. Uh, we were always running out before folks were there. there. It was just very difficult to manage and almost, 
almost always there was somebody upset by it, one or more people. And uh, so one of our pastors came up with the idea. He, he just raised the flag and, and see who would salute. He said, look, we, get, we can get food at the food bank for a nickel a pound. Do any of you want to chip in a couple bucks? And then I'll go over to the food bank with that money, and I'll, I'll buy what you want. And, and uh, anybody that's put in their money can, can have their share of food. And there were about a dozen folks that said, yeah, they'd be interested in that. And they put in a little money. And so the pastor came back, and uh, here was the food from the food bank. And they split it up among themselves. And it was a good deal. It, was, it expanded their food dollar significantly. And... Uh, then uh, a number of other folks said, yeah, I'm interested in that. And so that, uh, that uh, little food co-op grew from 12 to about 40 people. And uh, uh, then it was quite a task to get all that food back over to the church. Uh, but the pastor was bringing some food that folks didn't like. They said, we already have more peanut butter than we want. We don't need more peanut butter. And... Uh, so he said, well, let's just, why don't you guys elect a, uh, a buyer who can, who can say, here's what we want this week. Give me a shopping list. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact you have that person come over with me, and I'll, I'll just, I'll drive. And so that worked out a whole lot better. So folks could order what they wanted, and it would come back uh, uh, pretty much, pretty much if, if the supply was there. Uh, and so that worked, that worked very nicely as a food as a food co-op. And as folks uh, were distributing, they were getting the food, distributing it into boxes so everybody would have their share. Uh, conversations always going on. And uh, one lady said, you know, Miss Smith's, uh, she, uh, you ever tasted her sweet potato pie? Oh, to die for. And they said, Helen, why don't you, why don't you bake up a pie and bring it in here one of these Wednesdays? And she said, well, maybe I will. And so she did. She, she brought in a couple of her sweet potato pies, and they, they cut it up, and each had a taste. And, and they said, oh, that's wonderful. And, and then somebody else said, well, I can make, a, I forget what it was, some culinary delight, and brought that in the next Wednesday, and they all shared it. And... Uh, then somebody brought in uh, a, a great big batch of fried chicken. And so now when they're just dividing up the groceries, they're sitting down and having a meal together that they, they've cooked up. Then they go to the pastor and they said, could we prepare a meal here in the church for us? They said, sure, that'd be all right. Now the members of the co-op are preparing their own food that they've bought with their own money for themselves. We have moved away from a betterment activity to a development activity. They're doing it for themselves. They have, they have cooking abilities. They've got culinary skills. And, and so it's moving from serving others to them serving themselves. One lady says, uh, you know, I've always, always had the dream of having a restaurant. And another lady says, you too? I've always wanted to do that. So they get into this discussion. They go to the pastor and says, uh, said, uh, any, any chance that we could do a restaurant? And he said, well, I don't know anything about restaurants. So he, said, he said, I know somebody that's in the restaurant business. I'll, if you want me to, I'll invite him to come over. You can talk with him. And so they did. And he told about all the difficulties of running a restaurant and how much it cost and the health department and competition and all kinds of stuff. And they said, well, if we raise the money, uh, would you kind of consult with us and help us, help us put the plan together? And he said he'd do that as a volunteer. And got the pastor to help them write some proposals. And over about a two-year period, they identified a location, they raised money. And uh, now, if you come out of an Atlanta Braves game, out the main gate, look across the parking lot, a little concrete block building, bright, red, bright uh, yellow, and on the top of it, it says, Tummy and Soul. And you can get some of the, some of the best down-home cooking in that little restaurant anywhere, anywhere in the city. 
And on each table, there's a, there's a little sign that says, this business is the outgrowth of the Georgia Avenue Food Co-op. Moved from a betterment activity to developing folks to people owning the lake, owning a legitimate business that contributes to the community. You get the movement. That's what I, that's what I want to work with you on for a couple of minutes about moving betterment activities to development activities. We, uh, we opened up a, 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 a clothes closet in our church early on and uh, gathered in clothes from folks all over the city. And uh, we had spare rooms and so we set these bunch of hangers and pipes and displayed clothes and invited the community in and said, uh, you know, these are the free gifts of God's people. Uh, freely they have been received, freely you receive. And so it was a wonderful spirit until we actually opened the doors. <laughs> and then folks, then folks came in and started grabbing and growling and, and snatching as many clothes as they could put in as many garbage bags as they could balance on their shoulders. And I'd, I'd go out and find the clothes scattered, scattered all over the community. They didn't have a place to try them on. And that, man, this is, this is bad stewardship. And uh, so we said, we got to put some rules on this. Got to limit the number of visits. Got to limit the number of garments. And so we posted the rules. That was like saying, let the games begin. Uh, can I get some garments for my children in school? That sounds all right. Can I get some garments for my sick uncle? Y you see where that's going. In no time, we're behaving like temple police, guarding the resources of the kingdom against the very folks we were there to serve. It turned into an adversarial relationship just overnight. So I, I was sharing this dilemma with a, a men's, men's uh, group in one of the churches that collected clothes for us. And uh, they said, well, you know, there's a simple answer to that. You know, the guys that are not there always have the simple answers to that. Oh, simple answer. Uh, they said, yeah, it's, uh, it's called the market. They said, if you put a fair rate of exchange on a desired commodity, cuts all that out. I said, really? I said, oh, yeah. I said, would you guys help us set that up? And they had a meeting and said, yeah, we'll take this on as our missions project for this year. And those guys set about doing what they do in their sleep. Uh, put, a, put a business plan together. Start real estate re research. Traffic flow patterns. This has got to be on a bus line. It's got to be accessible. Shop the competition. You got to bring it in right underneath the Salvation Army thrift store. You got to under, undercut them just a little bit. Uh, they said, now if we do this right, uh, we, can, uh, we can actually train folks here and, and move them out into the marketplace, into retail jobs. So you got to have state of the art cash register, you got to have barcodes. And uh, they said, a business like this takes about, uh, about two years to break even. And, uh, and they were right. Uh, it was about 18 months, uh, and that little business broke even. And that's been uh, about 25 years ago. It's never looked back. An amazing change took place in a relationship of folks in, with us in the community. Instead of being people that you had to guard against taking too much, they were now customers that you needed uh, you needed their dimes and their dollars to make the business go. And so they sensed that they were valued. And in a real way, they were valued. You had to have enough money to pay the light bill and to, uh, to pay, your, pay your staff. And so then the question was, how, how do we get folks coming back and how do we get more folks coming in the store? And so we took our, our trainees out to the shopping mall and we said, 
see how the other clothing stores are doing it. And they, they came back and compared notes, and they said, well, they said, they're friendly. They, just, they treat us nice. They said the clothes are arranged by size and, and by style. They said they have those uh, latest fashion arrivals in the, in the front, uh, and they got signs up, uh, sales going on, so they have their sale racks. And uh, somebody said, you know, uh, those stores, they smell nice. They don't, they don't have that musty smell like our store has. And so then the discussion uh, centered around how do we change the aroma of our store? And uh, mopping the floors, that'd be good. Uh, but if we had a pot of coffee going, that's a good, that's a good aroma. And uh, what if we got some... Uh, some little chocolate chip cookies that you put in a microwave. Get a microwave donated, put those in there. So the smell of co cookies and coffee is what customers uh, would, that's what would greet them when they came in. And they figured out if we need, if, if we know their names, if we can remember names and anything about their family, then when they come back in, you can say, hey, Miss Smith, how's your daughter doing? Or how's your mama doing these days? And uh, folks will want to come back in here and, and shop some more. You see the dynamic that has changed? These are not the objects of our pity or our charity. These are customers that we need, we value. And I want to tell you folks sense that immediately. We went out of our way to make sure that they would come back and we'd add on, you know, yeah, that's a beautiful, beautiful set of, the beautiful pair of pants you got, you would need a shirt to go with that. We just got a shipment of shoes in. So we're telling folks what to, uh, telling folks about uh, the new bargains. Here's what we found out. Nobody likes to be somebody's charity case, but everybody loves to find a bargain. It's universal. Everybody loves to find a bargain. We did, uh, we did something similar to that at Christmas time. I, uh, at Christmas time, I used to uh, do this uh, adopt a family for Christmas kind of program and give, give a family the, the name of uh, you know, the kids and their, the sizes and ages and all of that. They go shopping and then bring those gifts to, a, to a, a needy family Christmas Eve. And it was good, and I did a lot of that. It was, it was, a, it was a nice thing. Um, but when we moved into the neighborhood, and I was in the homes of some of the recipient families when, when the gift-bearing families arrived, I saw something that I'd never seen before. Uh, kids, of course, were all excited, jumping up and down. But the moms, they were, they were a little reserved, polite. But if there was a dad in the house, in the house he would just disappear out the back door. And it dawned on me what was happening was that in their own living rooms, right in front of their own kids, these parents were being exposed for their inability to provide. And it was, it, was killing, it was killing their pride. And the moms would endure that indignity for the sake of the kids, but it was just more than the dads can handle, and they just, got, they just went out the back door. It was like their impotence was being exposed in front of their, their family. And I said, boy, we gotta find, we gotta find a better way to do this. And so the following year, I asked folks that started calling in, I said, would you give an extra gift this year? I said, would you give the gift of dignity to the dads? And here's how you do it. Go shopping, get your gifts, but don't wrap them. Bring them to our little store, and we'll set up a whole section, call it the old toy shop, and we'll put a put a uh, somewhere between a garage sale and a wholesale price on those toys. And we'll invite parents to come in and go shopping. And if they don't have any money, we're creating cash flow here. And so we can afford to, to hire some folks so that they can have money to buy, buy for their kids as well. And then on Christmas morning, 
parents in the city will have the same joy that parents in the suburbs have of seeing their kids open the gifts that they have selected for them, earned through the efforts of their own hands. And there will be dignity in the process of giving. And uh, I said, here's, here's the extra gift that I'm going to ask for. Give the gift of the joy that you receive when you see those kids get the gifts that you bring. You know how much joy that gives you. Give that gift to the parents or to the dads. Well, that's a kind of a quantum leap from giving a gift to kids to giving a gift to sell. But we said that money, that money will keep, keep on giving throughout the year. That'll enable us to hire under and unemployed parents and train them in retail merchandising and move them out into the economic mainstream. Your gift will keep on giving all year long. We discovered that parents would a whole lot rather work and earn to purchase their own gifts for their kids than they would stand in the free toy lines with their proof of poverty. Nobody wants to be somebody's charity case. One-way giving leads to an erosion of human dignity. That's why betterment, though necessary, is not the place we want to stay. As, as important as it is for survival, when there's a crisis, we got to intervene with some crisis intervention. But betterment is not the place we want to stay. Betterment's an entry point uh, from which we move into developing human potential. We concluded that no one in our neighborhood was so poor that they had nothing to contribute to the process of exchange in the community. Nobody is that poor. Oh, somebody gets burned out of a house. That's different. But everybody has something of worth to, to bring to the process of exchange. There is, a, there is a magical gift that God has created and given to mankind. And that is the, the gift of exchange. It's the fundamentals of, of economy. And, and, it, and it goes like this. Two people, each has something that's desirable to the other. They come to the bargaining table. They make an exchange. And they both go away feeling like they got more than they brought. Now that is magic. And we do it every day when we find bargains. It's our economic system built on that. I'll work hard and I'll get money to buy that car. Process of exchange. I got what I wanted. I got more than I brought. If that's such a, a universal gift, why do we want to exclude the poor from participating in that process? Everybody has something to bring to the bargaining table. And so in every program, whatever it is, whether it's working with youth or whether it's working with seniors or working with, uh, with homeless folks, everybody has something to offer. Ours is the challenge of figuring out how to develop reciprocity, reciprocal relationships between folks. Doing it for people is bad charity. That kind of one-way giving basically communicates, you have nothing that I desire in return. Be grateful. But you don't have anything that I want. It's a, it's a very subtle form of put down, done uh, with the mask of kindness and love. Betterment activities almost always lead to unhealthy relationships. An unhealthy relationship is one that isn't reciprocal. It's always given. It's always given. And if a relationship is built on one-way giving, then that person, if, they, if they're going to stay in relationship with you, they've got to keep coming up with a need. Because it's one-way one giving. 
The challenge for us is to figure out what are the ways to move from betterment into reciprocal kinds of relationships. Okay, if I've stomped all over your programs, let me know. <laughs>